Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. After opening his first ever store in Africa about 40 years ago, Yam Group has branched into many more African countries and has plans for another 1,200 stores by the year 2014. We now joined by their general manager for African Managers. He's a man charged with the task of expanding the group's uh, reach into Africa. And we talked to him as one of the first batch of investors that are taking bold steps to move into African markets, despite dithering in the global market, chasing the promise of Africa. He is Bruce Lazel. It's very interesting, as I said to you, that you come from construction and you now find yourself in food. What would you call that? Fate? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I always say to my children, what do you know when you're 18 about what you want to do later on in life? So uh, I started out in the construction industry. Um, I then moved across to Vodacom to build their infrastructure, their towers, etc. And through that process, I got selected into the Vodafone's Global Leadership Program, which saw me go across to the UK on a secondment, do an MBA. Um, but I was in an operations environment uh, and looking to come back to South Africa and there was a position available with Yum Restaurants and uh, when I had a look at what a great company they were, the size and their global reach, I thought this is somebody who I wanted to work for and if you have the business skills you can apply them to any industry and, and that's what I'm doing here now. Well like you're saying, even when you were at Vodacom out there you always wanted to come back to South Africa. What is it about the environment in South Africa that made you want to come back? Africa and South Africa is an exciting place. There's a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of opportunity for young people to get involved in serious business early on in their careers. Uh, and I think that's always an attraction. You know, in, in Europe, in the US, uh, there's a lot of other people vying for positions, etc. So I'm not saying it's easier back here, but there's certainly the opportunity to show yourself earlier in your career, I believe. I see your company is taking uh, great strides to, uh, to, 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 to take over opportunity across Africa. I mean, Yam wants a thousand restaurants here within the next uh, five years or so, and they plan to increase their uh, uh, revenue to about $2 billion. Um, how do you really plan to do that in Africa? Because it's not quite the homogenous sort of continent it is, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I, as I always say, Africa is not a country. It's uh, currently 55 countries. But we've been in Africa for 40 years. We've got a 40-year-old business here in South Africa. We've been in the SADC countries for the last seven to 10 years. So a lot of that learning is helping us go into the rest of Africa. And there's massive opportunity there. I mean, you know, every single report that you open from the big five um, accounting firms, McKinsey's, et cetera, et cetera, is all saying opportunity is in Africa. There's all this growing middle class, the population is growing, wealth is growing etc. And we want to make sure that we get in early and take advantage of that. You're one of the few global companies that, that have taken bold steps into Africa. What's really informing that? I hear about the studies that you are seeing from all the research companies, all the business intelligence, but what is driving your strategy into Africa? Well, there's a billion people in Africa. I would say that their protein of choice is chicken anyway. We believe that we've got the best chicken. And that as the real fundamental business proposition is, is what the opportunity is. We want to go and sell people chicken. Um, people have disposable income out, out there and we believe that there's a real viable proposition for us to offer them great chicken and make money out of it. I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, talk about and, and the promise about the African consumer may at times be a little exaggerated, considering that a lot of them are just uh, people emerging from joblessness and getting into sort of the striving section where people are beginning to earn some income. The populations are still young. The populations still earn very little at the moment. Only the middle class seem to be, to be going up. Don't you have any apprehensions about this consumer boom in Africa? So... Absolutely. I think everybody is talking about the opportunity and saying there's this, you know, a billion people, wealth is increasing, go, go, go. We need to temper that with the reality of doing business on the continent. It is a difficult place to do business. What have been the specific challenges for you? Uh, infrastructure is, is a very important one. So power, water, two important uh, aspects of our business. Infrastructure to get our um, material around all of our, all of our stores to allow consumers to get to our stores. Uh, these are all things which complicate business there. There's also a lot of bureaucracy. Remember, we are dealing with 55 different governments with a different sets of rules, different trade laws, etc. So bureaucracy uh, creates a lot of drag on how quickly you can get into the country and have success.
Now, one of the things, of course, we talk about a lot in Africa is regional integration. We talk very much about harmonization of policies, uh, harmonization of trade policy, movement of goods, and so on. Um, what is it you would like to see if you were to speak to a government or to a president? <laughs> what is it you would want to see happen first? What is the biggest priority for you in that? Funnily enough, I've just come back from the World Economic Forum on Africa in, in Ethiopia, and I had the privilege of sitting at a table with uh, President Goodluck Jonathan from Nigeria. And we discussed this very point, that at the moment you've got all these great economic groupings, ECOWAS, SADC, etc., and they're great on paper, but on the ground for the businesses actually trying to make use of them and, and gain benefit from them, it's still a very difficult process. The freedom of movement of goods, of people is still very di uh, difficult, it's still re restrictive. Again, at the World Economic Forum, there was a lot of talk around making sure that these things work. And I think the governments of Africa understand that the, is a real, it's an imperative that these groupings start to, to work for the people in those environments and to benefit the people of Africa. Do you think uh, business is actually taking aggressive steps to get governments to actually pay attention? Because I think we've been talking this since the beginning of, since the 50s, since the formation of the AU, since the formation of every other multilateral body in Africa. Well, you know, it's, it's difficult to go and uh, knock on government's door all the time and say, change, change, change. I think you need to be actively involved in those economies before they're going to start to listen to you. So I don't think they want a whole lot of outsiders coming in and telling them you need to change. It will be great, and this is certainly our approach, let's get involved in the economy. Let's build a business in the economy. Let us, let them, let us show them that we're having some success in their markets, and they'll start to engage with us, and they'll start to listen to us. Now you are in these markets, one of the things you know that uh, is uh, uh, proving rather uh, uh, common uh, talk lately is that of having companies list in African exchanges. I mean, if you come into list here, why aren't you listing the stock exchange? You know, it works in so many ways. It's 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 also giving back, uh, but beyond that, it's also encouraging liquidity in the markets, and therefore you're encouraging the growth of that economy, and you make a lasting impression in that economy, and you have a stake in that economy. Um, what what are your prospects with regard to long-term plans? in these economies that you're investing in? So, so YAM is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and we won't be listing in any of the stock exchanges in Africa. Our benefit to the economy is through creating jobs. We want to use a local supply chain and create jobs right down into the real primary sectors of, of agriculture, etc. Uh, we want to be players in, in t raising issues with government. We want to be a real good corporate citizen being involved in CSI initiatives. That's how we're going to benefit uh, the economies that we go and play in, not through listing our, our brands on, on some local stock exchange. Now, looking at uh, the uh, prospects with regard to Africa's recovery, there's a whole lot of excitement. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is, what is the general perception of uh, multi international corporations such as yours? So we see Africa as a massive opportunity. There's no doubt about that. All the indicators are saying that there's improvement on the continent, the middle class is growing, um, et cetera, et cetera. We've all read those things. We see the opportunity. We know that you're not going to grab that opportunity just by going and dipping your toe in there. You've got to jump in there with everything that you've got. You've got to take a long-term a long -term, uh, view on the business to say that you're going to be in there for many, many years. Um, you know, we want to be a, a 20, 30, 40, 50 year business in, in these countries. We want to be part of the local culture. When people see KFC in a few years time, just like they do in South Africa, I want them to think that we're a local brand, that we're a Nigerian brand or a Ghana brand or a, or a Cote d'Ivoire brand, just like many South Africans think we're a South African brand. I, um, I, I've run out of fingers to count the number of South African companies that have gone into the continent and have come back. <laughs> we know ShopRite in, uh, in Egypt, we know uh, ShopRite in Egypt, we know uh, Naspers has tried to go into the continent, we know quite a few others. And they've since all sort of uh, closed down their operations and come back and refocus their initiatives. And I'm wondering, what have been the problems with companies such as this, leading to the closure of their business in some of these uh, countries? Sure, so I can't comment on any other company, but just on our approach. What our approach is that we need to make sure we understand local consumers. It's very arrogant to assume you can take a proposition that works elsewhere in the world and just go and drop it in a country and automatically the consumers must buy that product. No, you've got to get in there and work with the consumers and say, hey, what are the consumers wanting and how does our array of product meet that need. 
and then grow with the local consumers products that they're going to buy. And that's how you're going to build a sustainable business. If you just go and drop and say, well, this works in South Africa, so it's going to work there, I think that you're doomed for failure. Just one of the things, you know, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about actually getting out there and you're from your corporate experience of Africa, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, was uh, I read about last year, and in fact, a corporate executive here even asked the president about this question, what he's, he's doing about it, was, um, you know, ShopRite saying that it takes about 16,000 different pieces of paper, you know, to get their goods to move across the border into Zambia where they have their own um, uh, uh, other stores there that they have in, in the Sadek region. What is it like for you practically on the ground? And I'm just thinking about someone who works with perishable goods and I think chicken is one of the most regulated pieces of food because it can go bad very quickly. What are your practical experiences with regard to uh, moving your goods around? Absolutely. So, so there is a lot of bureaucracy in, in Africa and, and as we spoke about a few minutes ago, the regional groupings that should make some of that easier aren't currently working. Um, so so w there is difficulty. It, it does take a long time to get goods through, through harbours, etc. But it's our commitment, and I like to say this, that we're going to do KFC in Africa, not an African version of KFC. So the same standards that we would expect in, in Europe or the US or Australia or here in uh, Johannesburg, are the same standards we expect in the rest of the continent. So we will do everything that we have to do to ensure that our product moves through at the right time into the stores in the, in the right condition that it should be. But it is difficult. There's, there's yeah, no have doubt you had about a problem that. with skills? Have you had a problem with the supply chain? Anything that anyone can learn from? Absolutely. So again, we're going in there to say we want world-class standards. And at the moment in many of these countries, they don't have a, a supply chain that meets those standards. So before we can even open the door of our restaurant, We've got to spend a long, long time working with suppliers, getting them up to speed, showing them what the potential of our business could be, and helping them, helping them meet the standards. We don't just go and hand them a piece of paper and say, call us when, when you meet that. We will go and work with them in their factories, on their farms, showing them where they can improve to meet our global standards. It's key for us, and, and part of doing away with some of this bureaucracy, by the way, is building a local supply chain. So if we can get the local farmers, the local chicken producers, et cetera, to meet our standards, we can then do away with the need to pass through all the export and import um, bureaucracy that is so prevalent. You know, just last week, there was a, uh, a Gabonese businessman based in China, and he actually said he'd never go home to open a business because of the amount of bureaucracy and corruption. Then if you think about it, in ease of doing business. It takes 45 days to open a business in Burkina Faso. And of that, you go through 12 steps before you can get your business. How has been that experience for you? Being a multinational, maybe you get favorable treatment. We definitely don't get uh, favorable treatment and we certainly don't go and look for that. Uh, our business model is to work through franchisees. We tend to look for franchisees who have uh, an existing business within the country where we're going to work. So they already have the relationships, they have an understanding of what that process is, and they follow that, that process through. If it takes 45 days to, to do that, unfortunately that's what, it, that's what it takes. And we just have to build that in to our rollout plan until we open our store. So it is certainly a challenge. Where that becomes a challenge is, is, uh, is I think, for creating entrepreneurship in these countries. And, and that's, that's the big challenge. The, the, the guy who's looking to start a small business, maybe a small business that one day will supply us, he has difficulty in all the paperwork that has to go through and all the money that he's got to pay to get his little business uh, Maybe registered. that's what we pick it up when we come back. We're talking to Bruce Lazel. He is GM for Africa Markets at YAM International.